<laughs> it would be a war spot, eh? Hi everybody and welcome back to the Bulls Fancast YouTube channel with me, Gully, for your first tactical analysis video of 2023 and the first one of the Yulin Lopetegui era. Um, a lot of time has passed since my last video, um, a lot of things have happened, hope you all enjoyed the World Cup. Um, I've managed to spend my time uh, raising a little human being who is well aware of all the tactical nuances uh, of Wolverhampton Wonders Football Club right now it's the best thing I can do to, to try and get him to sleep to be honest um but uh I just wanted to dig into kind of the the initial start of the Yulin Lopetegui spell um as Wolves look to kind of resurrect their season and pick out a few themes that I've seen um a few things that have had a positive impact and um, a couple of negative ones as well and uh, naturally this team is is very much um you know, coming from a low ebb and uh, there are a few things that uh, Yulin has um, embedded into the side that have worked really well, a couple of things that haven't gone so well, but um, you, there are some definite signs of improvement uh, for sure. And I think everybody is attacking the second half of the season with uh, plenty of optimism. I've got a few um, headline stats just running across the bottom uh, ticker as well. Um, so, so keep an eye out for them, but I'm going to uh, start off obviously with kind of talking through the the shape uh, that you and Lopetegui has set the team up in to begin with. And to be honest, there isn't a fat lot of difference between what um, Yulen has done and previous management, including uh, Bruno Lage uh, and Steve Davis. We've actually set up in what has been a 4-2-3-1 up until this point. The names featuring there have been uh, Lopetegui's go-to, uh, aside from Joe Hodge starting uh, the game against Everton in his first match in charge in the Premier League. Um, but Mateus Nunes is featured in the last couple. Um, so we're in a 4-2-3-1. It's not massively different from from what I would say uh, Bruno Large set us up in, to be honest. But there's um, there's a definite, uh, more more of an, an intense kind of method to the, to the play. There's... Um, a little bit of shape shifting going on as well, which I'll come on to. Um, with uh, in each game, uh, uh, Lopetegui decided to switch to a back five uh, at certain points, at points successfully, at uh, other points not so successfully. I think he's kind of figuring out a little bit more about his team as he goes naturally. Um, but we have literally flitted between a four-two-three-one there or a five-four-one, as you would see here. Um, so just to talk a little bit more detail uh, about the shape, you can see a couple of examples here of how we've played in the same game. A couple of different systems. Um, you can see on the left-hand side where we're sat in our 4 shape and uh, on the right-hand side here, the 5-4-1, although um, our left wing back, who would have been Ryan Aknuri, is just out of shot uh, on that still. But the, in essence, you, you understand where I'm coming from here. Naturally, um, we're sitting a little bit deeper in the 5-4-1, especially that midfield line, is, isn't really um, intent on pressing the ball in any way. Um, so it can cause some issues. Now, if I move on to kind of how we look to play the 4-2-3-1, there's a, there's a bit more of a, a higher press and, and, and there's a lot more intensity. Now, Lopetegui has spoken quite a bit about how he wasn't quite happy with the fitness levels within the squad. And I think his team selection have, have really team selections have really told a, a story about who he trusts to kind of do the work out of possession, um, especially when you look at you know players like Huang, who you might not have immediately thought of as a as a natural starter in games, and um, João Matinho featuring uh, at the tip of the midfield, which I'll come on to in a bit more detail as well. Um, in this uh, still image here, you can see our whole um, midfield and front line all within shot, which isn't something that you probably expect to see in. Um, when we when we sit back in our in our shape with the extra defender, and that can cause us problems when we have dropped into 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 that more negative shape, as was evidenced by the goal that we lost to against Manchester United. Um, and if we kind of talk it through, 
you do obviously gain uh, width uh, in the back line in terms of our fullbacks are able to get out to, to the wide man and stop them playing a little bit sooner than if we are playing a back four. But what it does mean is that our wider forwards have to sit a little bit narrower um, to stop our two central midfielders from getting overrun. And you can see um, as we move through these three stills here, which is the build-up to the Marcus Rashford goal that won the game for Man United, you've got um, a driving run th from uh, from a defender, I think it's Rafael Varane, that, that, that creates a little bit of chaos naturally that that midfield kind of constricts and, and becomes quite narrow in there it's very tight there's lots of bodies around the ball ball feet finds its way out towards um the deepest midfield and because we're lacking an extra player who can go out and press plenty of time on the ball to play a pass out wide now I, I won't go into what happens obviously beyond this it was a pretty poor goal to concede technically uh from from that right side of our defense but as you can see there, our fullback isn't in a bad position to go out and actually press Rashford. He's not stood off him to the extent where he can just walk into the box. But because we're probably 10, 20 yards deeper than we would be if we were playing a 4-2-3-1, Manchester United is still in a decent position to actually attack our penalty area. And that's how they end up getting their goal. And so it was disappointing. Obviously, the, the shape change had an impact in a positive way against Everton, where a team with less quality than Man United naturally who had a, a home uh, fan base that were on their back to really try and push the, the team forward to score a goal at 1-1 in the game. We drew them on to us, left as Armitage already hanging out and, and cheating a little bit to actually attack uh, down the flank. And once the ball broke um, broke down in, in, in our half, we were able to break on them because they created that space for us in behind to, uh, to, to go and attack with the pace that we had in our forward line. Um, now, the first interesting kind of selection um, that, that Lopetegui's made is um, having João Matinho kind of featuring in what is ostensibly a number 10. Up until this point in the season, it tended to be Mateus Nunes who, who features in that if we are playing with a back four. Um, Steve Davis spoke about how he, he suggested that, that Nunes needed a little bit of work in terms of his off -possession, out of possession game to be trusted to play in the, in, in the two, despite the fact he made his name at Sporting. From a deeper midfield role, being able to break forward. Um, now, Matinho and Neves would tend to sit next to each other with Nunes in front, and Lopetegui has actually switched that round with Matinho in front of Nunes and uh, Neves, and and um, Nunes obviously sitting in that more natural position that, that comes to him. Now, you expect from your number ten quite a bit in possession. Usually, a creative force tends to play in that position. Um, someone who will get on the ball, make things happen, dictate play, create chances, score goals. We know Jean Martino isn't necessarily uh, an attacking force in that sense. Um, you can see here the touch maps uh, from him against uh, Everton Man United and Aston Villa. Lots of um, involvement in the centre of the pitch, the middle third in particular. Not too much around the penalty area. Um, and you'd say, you know, if he is there, then what, what is the purpose of actually him playing there? Interestingly, he has actually come with two assists in those three games, but th those situations were recycled from, from set pieces rather than open play situations where he was getting the ball into feet and sliding it into strikers and things like that, which shows his quality, but doesn't necessarily um, lend itself to being a natural number 10, receiving the ball on the half turn and being a bit more dynamic. You can see the numbers here, which um, which goes to show how, what level of creativity he has offered in those games. And it's nothing out of the ordinary from what you would have expected if he played in a slightly deeper position, uh, especially when you consider he, he takes set pieces and things like that as well. Um, so from my perspective, I think it's, it's important to understand that, again, off the ball, this is what Lopetegui really wants from his team. And every single game, it's been quite noticeable. We've kind of sat back in a bit of a 4-4-2 shape almost, with João Martinho going and pressing... Um, much higher up against uh, man, um, each team's uh, deepest midfielder, essentially, and stopping the ball, getting into that midfielder and allowing them to dictate the game from there. So in these stills, you can see him standing on Andre Anana for Everton against Casemiro uh, for Manchester United and uh, Douglas Luiz um, and Aston Villa. What I think the benefit of having him in those situations is, I think he's probably one of our best midfielders in terms of reading the game. Um, it also creates shorter distances for him to have to run. We know he's not a, a massively quick player. He has a 10-yard burst in him that means he can go and press well. But if you're if you're asking him to play from a deeper position and cover larger distances, um, then you're actually not helping him in any shape or form whatsoever. So I think it's been quite a clever move, actually, from Lopetegui. I wonder if he'll continue in that 
uh, in that vein. Um, he's obviously a, a trusted um, member of the squad. I always find it interesting that uh, when a new manager comes in and you're, you're looking for them to maybe drop a player, and Joe Martino's name, name has been mentioned in many quarters, especially with the form of Bibacar Traore kind of before the World Cup and looking for him to feature within that midfield. Um, I always find it interesting. And despite the fact that Traore has obviously had uh, injury problems uh, going into the, the restart, um, that, uh, you know, the familiar faces t t still tend to to operate um, regardless of which manager um, is uh, is taking charge. So, Matinho, who's had a bit of a, a decent run of form, to be honest, since Lopetegui's come in, and long may that continue. Um, the other player that is affected by that, obviously, is Mateus Nunes. And I don't want to go into too much detail about this because I think everybody's been looking for this ever since we learned a hell of a lot more about him um, earlier on in the season when we were linked with him. Um, I've done uh, a hell of a lot more detail on this with uh, with Dan Butler in a, in a scouting report uh, prior to him joining. And you can find that um, on our YouTube channel earlier in the season. But you, I've got two images that basically, you know, um, sum up Nunes in a nutshell. He's receiving the ball with his back to goal against Manchester United here under pressure from Bruno Fernandes. And in a flash, you've got him creating a chance for Diego Costa at the other end of the pitch. This is where, you know, at the time, obviously, before Mateus Cunha is ultimate, uh, ultimately going to be become that that record signing. But this is our records, record signing, most expensive player in our history. And we weren't using him to the to the best of his abilities. And then um, we, we saw in the Aston Villa game as well, when he's got that freedom to to kind of uh, break the lines and, and, and play himself out of trouble. He's a really dangerous player. And um, yeah, I think he's coming into a rich vein of form and uh, he's going to be a really key uh, weapon for us to actually build ourselves back up the table. And as we as we look to, to climb and uh, uh, win more games uh, against the teams around us, for sure, at least. It's a, it's a top quality midfield, Neves, Nunes and Matinho. And uh, it shouldn't be part of a team that is uh, sitting so lowly at the moment. But um, we all know our forward line is the, the main problem. And we're still not necessarily uh, prolific uh, when it comes to scoring goals. We've managed three in the first three Premier League games under Yulan Lopetegui, um, scored by, and, and two of them have been scored by Daniel Pedence. Now, a lot of uh, discussions around Daniel Pedence and his role within the team. Um, I spoke earlier, obviously, about how Lopetegui is basically creating a team that is built to to last out of possession at the moment. A lot of intensity. He wants the team to to really kind of go in full throttle for the first half at least. And I think in each of the three games so far, you would suggest the first half has been the best um, out of out of each each of those fixtures. Daniel Pedence himself wouldn't have naturally uh, lended himself to a role within a team like that, a high pressing team, but he is undoubtedly our most creative forward, our most impactful forward, and it's spelt out by the data that I've got in front of you here. Um, non penalty XG, highest rank within the squad, expected assists, shot creating actions, tackles and intercepts, interceptions within forwards, within all the forwards within the squad. He's actually first as well, so you know better than the likes of Costa, uh, Geddes, etc. Triore. Um, he's actually defensively out of possession, the best that we've got uh, in that forward line as well. So perhaps something that we don't necessarily notice uh, too often. Progressive passes received. Um, he's top of the list by twenty three passes, which is a hell of a lot. Um, and I think that was a big issue for us going into the second half of the Aston Villa game after he'd gone off at half time. Players weren't picking up uh, good positions to receive the ball and that's why we continually um kind of attacks breaking down in that in that second half and pressure was building on us by Aston Villa. And finally touches in the attacking third he's first by 114. Because of his diminutive size I think he actually is obviously you can't really go and engage defenders with his back to them and, and try and work his way out of situations like that. So he's had to be a lot more clever in terms of picking up spaces and, and working his way out of um, tight situations. And because of that, he's almost, you know, one of our better players and actually holding the ball up and holding the ball up higher up the pitch. Um, despite not being like a big centre forward, you, you expect when you say, you know, I, I say to you, someone that hold, holds the ball up is someone who has got their back to a defender, is fighting them, someone like Diego Costa. 
but actually Pedence is probably our best player in, in helping us maintain the ball, despite the fact he loses it in certain scenarios. If it's high up the pitch, it's not such an issue. But if we aren't getting out of the middle third, you know, then that's an even bigger problem for us, I think. And Daniel Pedence is the one man who actually helps us do that. Now, Lopetegui has used all of his subs in all of the games so far. He switched to a back five, I think, because he doesn't think the team can maintain the intensity of the pressing uh, that uh, that he demands of them based on the fitness levels that he's encountered when he first joined the club. Um, I think his timing in terms of switching to the back five has been a little bit off on a couple of occasions. I would say in the Man United game, he did it too early because we weren't in a situation where we were under pressure too much in terms of um, a sustained period of pressure from Man United. Once we dropped off, we allowed them in to do that and they scored. Against Aston Villa, we suffered quite a bit territorially, um, I would say, and I would have suggested he brought on Totti a little bit earlier uh, than he did. He obviously ended up doing it um, in the aftermath of the goal, which maybe was just pure coincidence and, and misfortune. He, he was planning to do it at the time. But, you know, pressure told in the end and we conceded and we, we, we lost the game. I think if we go to about five against Villa, we see it out because we were doing really well in terms of um, stopping crosses coming into the box. But the, the pressure was uh, was quite incessant, um, to be honest. But I think you can see in the transfer window, obviously he's going to be making moves. He's brought in Mateus Cunha. We've had links to a bit more kind of dynamic, physical players who can maintain that intensity and the, the work rate that he wants us to... Um, to implement into our game but as i've said you know some of the numbers that are running across the bottom of the screen when you when it comes to the most tackles won so far this season it was aston villa the most fouls committed in a game it was everton most yellow cards received it was against everton as well there's just an intensity and aggression that he's added to this team which is quite disappointing to think that that's all it might have taken for us to improve but it's clear and evident that that is beneficial to our game. We've got players who really want to get stuck in, you know, even seeing Quang going quite late on Douglas Luiz and, and, and catching his ankle was a sign of that. He's not a natural aggressive player in that sense. So I think that was, that's really the biggest kind of stamp he's, he's, he's put on the, the side for the moment. So going into um, games against the likes of West Ham, fragile as well. I think, you know, home crowd get get this up to kind of support the team i think um, he's onto a winner in that sense and hopefully as he brings in more players uh, that he wants to uh, the team improves and we start picking up points again <laughs>